Okay, so hello everybody and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, before, my name's Kathy, and I'm a Programs and Planning Coordinator with Central Coast Council. So um, it's lovely to have so many of you here today to um, hear Anthony talk about his new book. Before I introduce him, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we meet today. I recognise their strength and resilience and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I extend my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us here today. Okay, so Anthony Hill is a renowned historical fiction author who writes for both adults and children. In a varied career, he's been a newspaper and television reporter, a political journalist, an antique de dealer, a speech writer for the Governor General, and now a full-time author. He's written 19 books of stories ranging from the First and Second World Wars, Soldier Settlement, Prisoners of War, boy soldiers and war orphans to convicts and the Aboriginal stolen generation. His best-selling books include Soldier Boy, The Burnt Stick, The Story of Billy Young, Young Digger and Captain Cook's Apprentice. I've enjoyed reading The Last Convict, which is what we're discussing today, and I'm looking forward to chatting with Anthony. So I'd just like to welcome you, Anthony. Thank you very much for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah. It's quite the thing these days, isn't it? These Zoom meetings are great. It is. It's, it's fabulous. I love them. So um, I'm going to get straight into the hard hitting questions. So this is this is your book, which actually um, has been published this year. Um, but there's a bit of a story. And I think maybe you were just telling us before we let everybody in um, about where it actually was published first. Well, it was first published last year in Italy. It came out in Italian translation uh, before it came out in its original language, English. Uh, it was to have come out in June last year with Penguin uh, Random House, but because of COVID, you know, everything was put was put back. The bookshops were closed, but the Italian people who take taken the book wanted to proceed, and they did, and it came out uh, in Italian uh, in uh, last October. It's very unusual, quite rare for a book to come out. Uh, first in a language other than the original one. So, so we've got we've got the English version out now. So it's hot off hot off the press. And congratulations that you've managed to get it out. COVID didn't stop it from happening. Um, for those of you who haven't read this book, um, can you just provide a brief overview of what the novel's all about, its storyline, and and things like that? Well, it is an historical novel based on the life of. Samuel Speed, who, so far as we know, was the last of the transported convicts to survive in Australia. He came out to uh, Fremantle uh, in 1866 on the convict ship Belgravia, and he lived on until November 1938. I mean, into the modern era. It's shortly before, on the eve of the Second World War. Uh, within the lifetimes of many people still living, only uh, less than four years before I was born. And I came across this story, uh, mention of him in a magazine article in 2004, and it sort of stopped me in my tracks. And I thought convictism was in the dips distant past, and here it is, still in the modern times. And I set about researching this story. It was uh, quite not difficult to find the, you know, the details of his of his criminal career, his conviction. He was actually convicted with a friend of setting fire to a barley stack near Oxford in 1863, not through any political motives at all, but because they were starving and they wanted to go to prison to get regular meals, something to eat. Quite shocking, actually, when you think about it. Uh, but it turned in for him into 72 years exile uh, from his homeland. I always thought the proper a title for this book should be Crime and Punishment, but <laughs> as I said, that's been used. It uh, does. It's, so it is a historical novel. It wasn't really. I was coming into it and back from it. We couldn't get beyond the bare bones of him. I couldn't find out who he really was until a couple of years ago I was determined to write it and my wife found, she called out from bedroom, I was in the study, she said that, have you seen the ABC website? And there was uh, an article about Speed by some English professors who had managed to find an interview. 
he gave with a Perth newspaper only a couple of months before he died. And there was a photograph of him as a very old man. He was in his 90s. And suddenly I had some flesh uh, to put on the bones that I disinterred. Yeah. And the story began to unfold, you know, what he was looked like. like and you look at a face, an old man's face. Am I getting you a lot of that. <laughs> Can you say it? Yeah. Yeah, Look, yeah. So very kindly old face, intelligent, I think. Um, yeah. uh, clever, you know, it's, he survived all these years in prison. Um, and slowly the idea began to take shape in my mind. But I told it, I, uh, the format of the story is all based on the single day. It was one morning in August of 1938 that he gave this interview to the newspaper reporter. And it's just structured around uh, the reporter coming to see him uh, and what he's telling the reporter about his life and most importantly about what he's not telling the reporter about his life. Many things he wants to keep hidden. In 1938, to admit that you've been a convict was a very shameful thing still. Not until recent years have we Australians hunted through the archives to find a convict in our past. Uh, before that, it was you know, something you kept, uh, kept hidden within the family. And, but I'd so I used it as a narrative of the old man talking, telling the reporter a little bit, but inside remembering the whole of the story. So it's a uh, it's it's a, a constant dichotomy between past and present, what he's saying, what he's remembering, and 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 trying to keep in his mind uh, the real truth of things at bay. Yeah, definitely, and. Um... So I think what really sets the scene nicely is the very first page of the book and it, it sets it with that dichotomy in mind and, um, and also just the effect that it, it's had on him right up until old age. Would you like to read that first page? Yeah, I'd be quite happy to read it uh, because part of it, part of one of the, the themes that I try to develop in the story is as a study of old age, just a topic not often touched about. Uh, in, in, in literature these days, and, you know, old age, elderly people, I wanted to give an idea of what it was like, and indeed, I must say, some of Sam's pains and ailments are not unknown to me at this stage in life. <laughs> so this is the first little bit of chapter one, Old Men, Perth, Western Australia, August 1938. It wasn't me! The old lad stirred uneasily on his dormitory bed, at liberty and sleep, yet imprisoned still within a frail body and held by the shackles of memory. He'd been dreaming, as he often did, of smoke and fire, the gum-scented pleasures of a billy boiling in a bush camp and a yarn over the coals after a day's labour. Sweet dreams, shifting in the way they do, to an image of hot cast iron and an ember glow that sweated but never warmed you as too many broken old men huddled around the stove on a winter's night. The aroma of salt beef boiling in the mess deck copper on the transport Belgravia, drifting with the sea breeze to the convict decks below. Food that filled, yet failed to nourish. And before that, the smell of dry grass and sulphur to the ghosts had become more disturbing. A wicked yellow flame and a pale spectre of smoke that rose in the darkness to billow and surround him, acrid and flicked with black burning cinders until he could see nothing and cried out in his fear, it wasn't me. Samuel Speed woke up, frightened as always by the old vision. The blanket was in a tangle and the sheets damp, as if he'd wet himself in the night. Not uncommon now at his age, though he hoped it was only perspiration and not the result of a too vivid nightmare. Incontinence was frowned upon. I'm sorry, he'd have to tell Matron, but what do you expect in the 90s? Yes. Thank you. That was amazing. It's even better when you read it. I love it. Um, so what I what I took from that 
to is um, when you, you describe a lot of the things that happened to Sam along his journey, you use quite a lot of historical information and references and it indicates a substantial amount of research and we certainly see the harshness of the judicial courts of the time and of the convict life. What sources did you use for your research? Uh, well, uh, the main... Uh, the main resources I discovered uh, for the convict life uh, in Australia, uh, there's a number of secondary references. There are some primary references available. Um, I was made a visit to Fremantle. You always have to visit the scenes that you're setting your books. You, there are all these metaphors and landscape to be drawn out of it. I was very fortunate that at Fremantle Prison uh, was built in the early 1850s. Samuel Speed was in prison there. Uh, the cells are the same. It was used as a prison up until the 90s, really, 1990s. Um, uh, I uh, got acquainted with the curator, Olympia Cullity, <clears throat> and, his, and her deputy, uh, Eleanor, and they were wonderfully sources of material to me. They sent me, for example, uh, the complete prison regulations from 1863, so that I could actually even calculate how much uh, the pitiful allowance Samuel Speed would have been paid when he finally got his ticket of leave. He got paid two and two thirds farthings a day. There were four farthings and a penny. So it took, a, it took a, almost two days to earn tuppence. Uh, and it was those sorts of regulations. There are memoirs of the old men's home uh, written by a man whose father was the uh, superintendent of the old men's home and Sam was there, all sorts of anecdotes and stories from that time. In England, I uh, visited uh, Oxford. Uh, I went to a town called Woodstock outside of Oxford where the offence happened. Uh, I visited the court. I saw the dock. I went into the prison. Uh, it was, in fact, uh, in Oxford Castle that he was in prison. And I, I went to the castle. Uh, also, I found a, a wonderful book uh, called The English Convict System, um, written by Mayhew and Binney, and it was published in 1863, and it was a full overview of the prisons in London of the time. Ox uh, Ox Sam was in Oxford and Aylesbury and later Chatham, but what they had to describe about the prison system was enormously informative, and I based the whole uh, great section of the story upon what they said. Um, in the newspaper interview that I read and which, as I said, provided flesh for the bones of the story, it was what the old man said and what sometimes he didn't say that gave you the clues as to what may be behind his story. Um, for instance, he said, well, we know from the newspapers in 1888 that he gave two and sixpence, 25 cents, to a Sunday school appeal to a flood in oh, Western Australia. And um, uh, it, it suggested to me that he'd actually returned to the church in that, at that time. Um, he also uh, made reference to having read uh, to a, a short story by Mark Twain. And I thought, well, if he's read Mark Twain, he's possibly read Charles Dickens as well and the other good authors of the period, uh, George Eliot and Brontes, and later on uh, Kipling and others. He had a long association with the uh, Braille Society, we know from the records, and the Braille Society organised his funeral. So in my telling of it, I became, uh, Sam becomes a reader. He never married, he never had children. And in my interpretation, it's the characters in the books that actually become his closest companions in life once he gets out of jail. So all of these sources sort of fed into it and Mayhew and Binney uh, just showed how the English prison system for all its horrors did at least ha have schools in the prison uh, and the prisoners uh, were taught if they wished to, to read and write. Uh, they could also have a book, borrow books from the library, but the only way you could get a book was to show the chaplain, uh, chaplain of the prison that you could read the New Testament. So I had to get Sammy learning how to learn how to read the New Testament. And all of this added to the, to the sort of detail 
uh, with which I was able to sort of people uh, the book and uh, the things I was able to draw out from it. Yeah, definitely. That was that was one of my main things that I took from it was the the impact of literacy that it had that had on Sam's life. So mm. it, it's through every step of the way you see him learning to read and tricking people to get more time to read. And this mm. is a characteristic of Sam that I particularly enjoyed and one that I noticed right up until the, you know, the the interview that he's characterising is his ability to play the system yes. and to play the game. So was that an intentional characteristic that you brought out or did oh, it just yes. evolve? Very, very much so. I looked at it. You look at his face, it's, a, it's not an unkind face. But it's an intelligent face and a clever face. Um, I, I have a, a friend uh, who's a medical doctor who's advised me on all of my books from the, the medical advice. And I showed him Sam's photograph. And he said he's taken his teeth out. He's <laughs> taken his false teeth. Look at the face. It's all shrunken and hollow. And I thought, this is a device. He's done that to make himself look more sad, more pathetic, so that your people will be give, give him more sympathy. And uh, throughout this, I've had him. I've had him uh, playing these games. He, he, in my view, he wouldn't want to see his whole story plastered all over the newspapers. A convict in 1938, but he did it because I think the home asked him to. Uh, you know, to get publicity for the old men's home and raise a few funds. But, you know, I had the report makes it clear he was in bed when he gave the interview. And so I had him deliberately deciding he was going to have a cold and had to go back, back to bed for the interview, where he was gratified to know that he was a good head higher than the reporter sitting by his bedside. He was able to look down on the journals. And uh, others, uh, one one person who spoke to me about the book uh, said uh, uh, at a library in Victoria said that they that they got the impression that Sam Speed was con in control of the interview the whole time and that was the intent that was the intent not to say very much as little as he could about himself quite happy to open up about other people and so telling some of the stories that I tried to tell for another gener a new generation uh, about Moondine Joe and the Fenians and the escape on the Catalpa and things like that. Quite happy to talk about that, the old bloke. But when it comes to himself, he's very reticent. Which yeah. is important now to simply being forgetful, which is the intent. Yeah, he definitely, he definitely does play the journalist really, really well. He does, he does manage to get what he wants. And he's also, before he goes for that interview, who was also warned not to make it too interesting or or controversial. Nothing too grim. Not, nothing yeah, nothing too, too grim. grim. Nothing right. too grim. Nothing unpleasant. Just nice little anecdotes that people like to read over there, Wheaties in the morning. Yeah. So what you see from his thought processes is, oh, I can't tell them that because that's too grim. So he's then, again, sort of doing what he needs to do in the system that he's in um, to make sure that he doesn't upset anybody. And I saw that quite a lot in in his different places where he was he was very compliant. He was very um, well behaved mm -hmm. as a as a convict. And he was a survivor. Uh, and uh, there is nothing on his convict record at all uh, to indicate that he had anything but good behaviour during his time as a convict, nothing to suggest that he was uh, convicted of any offence or crime afterwards. Many convicts were, but there's nothing on Sam's record to, to suggest that. Um, and uh, I think personally that the system had so frightened him uh, you know, it did what it achieved. It so terrified him that he, he was not going to spend another hour longer in custody if he could help it. And so steered well, well clear of uh, convicts in prison, in the prison system that he knew could well present a danger of being drawn into some conspiracy to escape or commit that outrage. And even outside, he knew when he was going to come across another Another mate who might end up in prison, end up sending him to prison with him. 
Yeah, and I think that's that's the thing. He got caught up in the whole agreeing to burn the the Rick burning, the the barley burning, and um, and I think he was determined not to do that um in the prison system as well. That's right. I mean, it was so horrible the the punishments that they had, uh, especially in Britain, uh, the uh, picking oakum, which is tearing apart with your fingers, lengths of tarred, weather torn, a uh, ship's rope tearing it apart so you had to put each strand of the rope out at a time into little heaps, put them in little heaps on the uh, tray. And this was used to actually cork the decking of ships and things like that. Um, or these mindless punishments such as the treadmill, um, which was just a hating staircase, which 20 men at a time had to cling on to a bar and just walk as, as, the, as the wheel just rotated underneath their feet. Um, or the crank, which was much the same thing, just mindlessly, endlessly turning a machine, sometimes 12,000 revolutions a day. It was terrible, it really was. And uh, it was to escape this, uh, not in a physical sense, because he knew he couldn't do that, or if he did, he'd be caught, but to escape it into the realms of books and reading that, that for me, uh, presented... Uh, Sam, the only way out of the, the torture of it. Yeah, reading is definitely his um his saviour in that. So what um I'm just having a look at what else I've got to ask you. Um, I must say the, the books I had him the books I had him reading were some of my own favourites, so so I knew them well. <laughs> definitely, there's there's so many classics in there. Actually, I've got a, a Dickens down um downstairs I should have brought that one up to to show everyone it's it's like a really old copy of it um but your experience as a writer you obviously have a lot of experience writing and it it comes across in the page um it's very engaging and you've got a huge depth of characters and themes but going back to your Canberra press club days is there a story that you'd like to share about about one major thing that you'd like to share with us? Uh, well, I, I was in Canberra. I was a journalist for the old Melbourne Herald, uh, an afternoon newspaper. And I was in Canberra in the press gallery from 1972 to 1977. Now, it was the last year, the last months of Billy McMahon, then the Whitlam, it's time election and the Whitlam years, then the dismissal and 18 months of Malcolm Fraser, I was there. We ended up going to the country and running an antique shop and all of that. I was better suited to that than the, than the, than the rigours of journalism. But, but I have to say I was there on the day of the dismissal, the November the 11th, 1975, when uh, Whitlam was, was dismissed by the Governor General Kerr uh, because of the, the blockage of supply in the Senate. And I was there at uh, two o'clock, just before two o'clock in the afternoon, and I heard that Whitlam had been dismissed. Now, nothing official had come through yet, but I'd heard it. And uh, the next edition of the newspaper was about to come out, two o'clock, the copy stop. I rang the news editor, and for the first and only time in my life, I said, you'd better hold the front page. <laughs> I've just heard. <laughs> and within a few minutes, we got confirmation. And, and the paper the paper did it. it was amazing. They were able to completely remake it. And it was an hour late back onto the streets. But, my golly, the, the, when it came out, we had the story and the last edition had it in a more complete detail. But it was uh, the first and only time and something I'll never, ever forget. Ever. Yeah. Yeah, no, a big moment, a huge moment. And newspapers play such have played such a significant role in your life and in your career. And it's it's interesting that a newspaper article sparked this next chapter of, of your career. And um, I just wanted to not mention- only that, Not only that, if I can just add that one of the principal characters in the book is a journalist. Now, yes. now, the, now who's interviewing Sam? Uh, now, the, the newspaper article doesn't name the journalist. There's no byline. So I had to make up a character. I imagined a character whom I call Joshua Cribben. But I have to tell you that he contains many fragments of my younger self, <laughs> as and some of the incidents and anecdotes that are put into his into his career sort of certainly have come directly from my own. So I, I write from the heart. 
Yeah, and and it comes it comes through on the page definitely that journalistic um, vent, uh, angle that you come with, but also too you used newspaper articles from Trove quite a lot in yeah. in your writing, and and you mention it in the book as well too. Was that where you found the newspaper article for the last convict? Oh yes, uh, no. Well, it is on Trove. Uh, I hadn't found it. I when I was doing my first lot of research years and years ago, it hadn't been digitised. It was only when the written, my wife came across the article on the ABC website and they had found the article on show. And it had obviously been digitised after I had done my last week. You probably would have found it when we were doing it this time through, but there it was, straight away. And within a fortnight of finding it, I'd actually begun writing. It was quite, quite amazing. Yeah, you know, all these ideas that are in your mind uh, and the head that develop over 14 years I've been researching this story, uh, they just began to, to come out onto the page, They're almost fully formed. It was like taking dictation in a way. Uh, but the newspapers uh, were a very prominent part of the research. Uh, not only was Sam's newspaper, his own interview there, uh, we also found on Trove uh, at the uh, through the Oxford uh, Jackson's Oxford Journal, the full report of his trial, and in 1963 at Oxford, and uh, it was an assize, the winter assizes in November, and there were a number of cases. There were 11 people at that sort of charged with haystack burning, brick burning. Uh, it was very common, and the, the the reasons behind it were invariably the same. People were starving; they were destitute and uh, were burning haystacks to get taken to prison, to get something to eat, which the judge, and this is what struck me, and it kept me going through all these years, before the hearings began, the judge gave a whole lecture to the jury, which could be heard by the prisoners downstairs, telling them what a terrible thing all this rick burning was. There was so much of it going on in the country. People were doing it because they were destitute, but it was a terrible thing to do, and he thought, It'd be a good idea to bring the lash back and give floggings to people who burnt haystacks. It would prevent it. He didn't say anything about whether it would prevent them starving, uh, which forced them to commit these crimes. But it so angered me. It was so unjust. He was poisoning the jury's mind before it even began. Today, uh, a judge who do that would, have, would, be, would be taken off the bench. He wouldn't be allowed to proceed. Um, uh, and yet there it was. And I kept all these years, I kept thinking, one day, my friend, one day I'm going to publish this book and I'm going to expose you and for what you did. <laughs> and I gather, I believe, copies of the book of uh, one of the English booksellers have taken copies. And I'm just waiting to get some irate correspondence from descendants of the judge. I'll be happy to refer them to the transcript. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're only. I mean, it is historical fiction, so there's a big difference between a historical um, well, an account and and the historical fiction. But you have based it on that. Oh, that's right. And all of my all of my historical novels are, are, are done that way. Um, some people write historical novels, and they uh, based on fact, but but they don't mind altering the facts if it suits their literary purposes. Names and spouses and locations and things, occupations will change to suit the purposes of the of the writer. I never do. Uh, with all of my books, uh, from the first of them, uh, Soldier Boy about the young Anzac, through to Sam Speed, um, the externals of the story are as accurate as I can make them. Uh, the not just of the what was actually done, but everything surrounding it, the details of the prison system in this case, the details of the, the old men's home, what they did when he was on his ticket of leave, etc. Uh, as accurate as I can make them, and I draw on newspapers of the period, uh, every so any source I can think of to, to make it as authentic as I can. The internals, of course, of thought and speech and emotion. Uh, these can only come from the, the novelist himself or herself. It can only come from within, and that's me. I assume uh, that when the characters start to speak, uh, 
and the reader will realize that this is me. It's, it's, it's made up. I don't know, except if you have a diary, it might give you a sentiment. But, or in Sam's case, the interview. But, but mostly speech and that and thought can only come from the novelist. But I also, the trouble, the thing about historical fiction, and a, a number of authors uh, face the same difficulty, that the more skilled you become at writing it, the more difficult it becomes for the reader to distinguish between historical fiction and historical fact. You know, if you can, the better, more easily you can blend them together, it becomes quite difficult. And sometimes uh, things that you have to assume uh, uh, and put it in the book as an assumption uh, get taken as, as, as a historical fact. And then in a couple of cases, uh, in my case, uh, I've, to my horror, I've noticed them being taught in school. And so I, uh, I, I always, since Soldier Boy, which I didn't do it and I should have, but ever since Soldier Boy, the Lee's novels, I put in uh, a set of chapter notes explaining what the sources are, um, adding bits of interesting information that would be out of place maybe in the novel, uh, but where I've had to make assumptions, saying what those assumptions are, or where I've had to imagine a character, saying what that imaginary character is. And uh, well, I've had to make assumptions, at least giving the reasons that I tried to make them as, as plausible uh, as, as I could. Um, it's the only way I know of getting around this problem of, of historical fact. Fiction. Yeah, and yeah, and I read those those chapters, and they are very enlightening as well, too. And it's often the more interesting part of the book, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean. I like the history bits that are that are in the back. Yeah. I like to read every single little bit of a book. Um, but this book is definitely aimed as adults and the narrator obviously is Sam in his 90s. Have you considered creating a version for younger readers with Sam as a young person? It's very interesting that you should say that uh, because in the story we, we're constantly flipping between old Sam and young Sam, between what he's saying and what he's thinking. Um, uh, between past and present, it's a constant, uh, constant slippage between one and the other. And one of the, uh, another one of the interviewers, uh, the book came out, did ask this very question. He thought it might make uh, a good uh, book for young for younger readers. And I've mentioned that to the publisher, and we'll just see how this goes. I think before making any decision. But of course, if I was to do it for young people, you, you approach it differently. This is the old man really looking back. If you're going to write it for younger readers, you wouldn't do that. You'd start with a haystack fire. You'd start with a fire. And, you know, the starving boy on the street and going with his friend, let's burn a, a, a barley stack down. We can go to prison and get something to eat, not quite realising what the consequences of that would be. And I think you'd do it that way. Take a more linear approach than... Uh, you listen, of course, when you're writing for adults, there are areas that you can't really go into if you're writing for kids. I mean, I'm, I, I try to give in this book um, a, a, to show Sam and his wholeness, which is why when I have him working, uh, being, waking up in the morning and then the orderly comes, uh, they all had orderlies at these places, came to help him get dressed. And I knew that I wanted to show Sam Speed in his nakedness. He takes off his nightshirt and he's there. Uh, he, he had a hernia strap, we know that. And show him there in, in his complete nakedness, in his fragility and frailty, this poor little forked old man. Before I started clothing him in narrative, and that means you've got to talk about aspects of life, sexual life and this sort of thing that is not appropriate for kids. And, and I wouldn't, you know, you'd have to treat it differently. Uh, but but uh, if you don't do it for children, you would certainly do it as starting off with a bonfire, I think. Something to look forward to then, maybe, fingers crossed. Do you have yeah, plans? <laughs> do you have plans for any more big historical novels? Well, I'm working on what I, I say is my last at the moment. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a historical novel uh, based on uh, Matthew Flinders and the Voyage of Investigator, 
1801 to 3, uh, which the first uh, ship to circumnavigate the continent. Uh, there were two Aboriginals on, on board the ship, interestingly enough, for part of the journey. One of them, uh, Bungaree uh, from Sydney, he actually completed the circumnavigation with Flinders. Uh, Flinders was the one who, he didn't, he didn't make up the word, but he did popularise the name Australia. Uh, when he published his journal, uh, at last it was a voyage to Terra Australis, the, you know, the Admiralty insisted on it, but uh, he would have called it the voyage to Australia. And in fact, within a few years of it coming out, Australia was being adopted as everywhere as a name of the country. He was the first, uh, it's very interesting, I'm at the point now, he's just entered Port Phillip Bay this morning. Uh, and uh, uh, just about the heads of that, go to the rip and the heads. Uh, he was the first in South Australia to refer to the Aborigines as these Australians. It was the first time you, you come across the, the, the term. And uh, I just adopted it, the native Australians. And uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's wonderful. And it's, the voyage was so important in, in the establishment of modern Australia with Cook, Cook and Flinders, the two of them, the two great navigators. Uh, and I, this is, uh, I'm seeing as a companion book to an earlier book of mine, uh, Captain Cook's Apprentice, which is about endeavour and the exploration of, uh, of New Zealand and the east coast of Australia by Cook uh, in 1768 to 71. So, and Flinders will be that. Well, we look forward to that. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll look forward to that one. Um, so we'll keep an eye out on the, the bookshelves and, and see It'll what we A couple of years, a few years yet, I think, but <laughs> I hope to finish it. Um, uh, the contract says delivery by uh, March of next year. So I'm ha nearly halfway through. So I've yeah. got 12 months to finish it. I think I'll be there. Oh, I think you'll be right. You yeah. can, easy, 200 words a day. <laughs> um, um, I'm going to open up to questions now. If anybody's um, got a question for Anthony that they'd like to ask, feel free to unmute your microphone or if you'd like, you can write it in, in the chat box there um, on the side of your screens if you're interested. Um, yeah, I have read this book. I, I found it, I found just while we're, we're waiting to see if any messages come through. I have read this book. I have found it very engaging and um, a, a very difficult to read in some sections about the harshness of the convict life. But I don't know whether it's the librarian in me, but definitely the literature theme that came across as the one focus that Sam had through all of his dark days was just amazing. So oh, how did you come up with the journalist's name? I made it up. Um, <laughs> every 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 name that you try, I try to think that every a name that you have to make up in a novel has some sort of meaning. And I thought, well, what name will I give give to the journalist? Uh, so I thought, well, Joshua is, is not a bad name. It's a strong name, you know. The man battering down the walls of Jericho. He's got strength and and, and conviction and character. And Cribben, well, you know. I've enough to, uh, lived enough to be cynical of journalists and journalism, and I know there's quite a lot of cribbing going on. So I, I thought, well, that's not a bad, that's not a bad way. But I gave him a wife and two baby twin daughters, and uh, that came from uh, actually that from a friend of mine who who did indeed have uh, twin daughters first up, and uh, he often told a story of this early night on. And one was howling and the other one wasn't, and they never knew which one was sick. <laughs> and that, that is the very first plan, image. <laughs> That's the very first image we have of this journalist as this frazzled young parent trying to get to work on time. And, um, you know, he wasn't in the best mood. And now he's got to listen to this old codger go on and he's not telling him anything interesting to write about. And it is just a, a beautiful image that you do paint of him. I was a bit too. I was a bit too. Uh, I was a bit too kind to the journalist. Actually, when I came to actually examine the article very, very carefully, I'd said that he, you know, he'd read in for the story and you know he'd check all his facts. Well, in fact, the articles that came to be written 
was full of historical inaccuracies. He didn't read it very well indeed. He gave Samuel the wrong ship, the wrong year, uh, <laughs> and all of this sort of thing. But, anyway. Yeah, his heart was probably elsewhere. He didn't on, do, on he didn't do enough ribbon in this case, I don't think. <laughs> no. Um, Danny's asking, is it available as an audio book? And I can answer that. Yes, it is. It is. It's, <laughs> yep. a beautiful reading. it's a very good reading, isn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, and I, I can recommend it to anybody, actually. And we do have that in our library catalogue. We don't have the print book at the moment. I'm sure it's not far away because I'm going to donate this one to the library and it'll be available in a few days for yes. um, once they catalogue it. Um, yes, the the, book, uh, the uh, audio book is read by Julian Garner and it's it's a very nice reading. Um, it's big, uh, Penguin. Uh, now, Penguin Books and Random House produce, have their own audio book production uh, oh, nice. uh, division now. Yeah, and for the first time in my career, for the first time, they sent three uh, sample readings up uh, to see what I thought about who would be better to best to read the book. The first time anybody's asked my opinion. Oh. I've been very fortunate with everyone who has, but <laughs> but we all agree that Julian's reading. He seemed to capture. Uh, for me, anyway, the particular rhythms with which I, I write. We all have our own. It's like a music. We all have our own style of mannerisms of writing, and there's the stresses and everything come in their own proper place. And Julian seemed to grasp that with my reading, and I was very happy. With it. That's. Uh, I've got a, I've got a couple more questions here. Um, we've got a question from Dan. Anthony, you seem to have an affectionate attitude towards Samuel. Is it important for a writer to like his main character? Well, the answer is yes. And uh, uh, Sam became very dear to me. I think I agree to knew him quite well. I mean, I've, he's lived with me for long enough, for heaven's sake. 2004, I first came across the story. Although I didn't really... Uh, get writing until 2018, at which time uh, the old chap, like every character in your book, sort of starts to take up residence in your house, like an extended <laughs> visitor. <laughs> He's actually only now talking of packing his bags and leaving <laughs> and going somewhere else into the homes, I hope, of his readers. Uh, but yes, I became very fond of him. Um, I don't know, I, I just, his character seemed to come off the page almost fully formed. I didn't have to wrestle with it very much. It, it, it just, the very beginning of starting with a dream and in the first page actually being able to give the outline of the story, you know, from the bush camp to the convict decks to the bonfire. Um, uh, I was, and him as an old man and the thought of the past present. Uh, it, it seemed to just come quite quite easily onto the page for me. But yes, he became very effective. The only other one that's been as close to me is uh, a young French war from called Henry or Henri, uh, who was the subject of a book uh, called Young Digger. They called him Digger. He was a little French war from who was actually adopted as a mascot by some Australian airmen and smuggled back to Australia uh, just after the First World War. And he became, still is, uh, very close to me, I have to say. Um, but, but Sammy's right there with him. Yeah, Old age definitely. and young lad. He's definitely a very likeable character. Um, I think you can see that in the photo. I, look at him, he, I can see that. My publisher thought he looked a bit creepy, but I don't. It was just <laughs> not having his teeth in. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's teeth are, his cheeks are very sunken sunken yeah. in i've got some beautiful feedback coming in from valerie she says thank you anthony i really enjoyed this talk and hearing all about the different sources you used and the different techniques you used in your writing today. that's very kind yeah. of you valerie thank you and taya has a question um i think it did sam learn to read after he went to prison what type of family did he come from he came from a poor uh, working class family the truth is that we really don't know of the many Samuel Speeds born in England. We don't know really which was the convict. In the interview, he was said he was born at Birmingham in 1840. Uh, but we examined five Samuel Speeds born in Birmingham or the surrounding districts, South Staffordshire, that sort of area. Um, 
between 1838 and 1850, there were five that could be possible to fix. And of those five, four were still living with their families at the time of the 1871 census. So it wasn't him, that wasn't them. And one had died in 1862, so it wasn't him. Now, either Sam, uh, Sam's uh, birth was not registered, and that's quite likely. I mean, lots of people's birth, particularly at that time, the uh, registration had only been required in 1837, I think. Uh, so it's quite possible that his birth wasn't registered. It's also true that he may have been lying about where he was born. Uh, but he did say that he had a brother and a sister. He'd never heard of them since he was convicted um, uh, from them. So, it, and it was years, it was 70 years later that he was telling all this. There was no reason to hide it. But uh, I don't, but we still don't know. One we thought was him, uh, who was born in 1849. And I've been in correspondence with a descendant of this man's family, who they think it was him. But the point is that in 1871, their Samuel Speed was living with his married sister in Birmingham. Now, it couldn't be him. The census was taken in April of 1871. And in April of 1871, Samuel Speed was still in Western Australia as a convict on his ticket of leave. He didn't get his freedom until July of 1871. It, you can't be in two places at once. Now, either, either uh, there was somebody impersonating Samuel Speed at the time of the census in this house, or it was another person altogether, and it's not the Samuel Speed that, that he was the convict. It's the, one of the great difficulties. It was why it took so long to actually get to the point of being able to put this story onto paper. We just couldn't find out, and still haven't been able to find out exactly which one he was. So I've had to keep a lot of things in the book fluid about his age, uh, his parents' name, uh, all of this sort of thing. I've had to keep quite, quite open and fluid and, uh, and really uh, paint very lightly over these, these early years. Of his. It's not until 1863 when he appears before the court that we actually see him in, in, uh, at a place that we can recognise. Yeah, and, and speaking of court, um, Taya, Oh, no, sorry, Jan has asked, were the other people sentenced in the court at the same time as Samuel transported to WA? Some of them were and some of them were not. At that time, uh, uh, any sentence of seven years and over automatically meant transportation. Uh, the first case that came before the judge on that day, they were sentenced to six years. So they would have, and now they got the full lecture about what a wicked highness thing they'd done and he hoped they'd find jail a lot less pleasant than they seemed to think and hoped it would soon be made even more unpleasant. Uh, there was a little boy of nine uh, called John Smith who was also charged with arson at this case, uh, this, these trials, but his case was deferred. They were waiting for another a witness, uh, but he was bound to get flogging. Um, the rest of them, I think, were all seven years or more, and they would have been transported. The way the system worked at that time, uh, once you were convicted, uh, you had to spend the first two years of the sentence in the English prisons. And in the English prisons, uh, at that time, the first nine months of the sentence uh, were spent in uh, what was called separate confinement. They were locked, each person was locked in an individual cell. They were kept there all day. They were allowed out a couple of hours a day, uh, once to go to chapel, once for an hour of exercise. Uh, they were allowed, if they wished, to have the schoolmaster visit them. And this is how I got Sam Speed to improve his reading. Now, the record show he could read and write when he got to jail, but I had to show how he could get to the point of reading Mark Twain and Charles Dickens. Um, after the first nine months in the separate system and also the silent system. There was no talking. They weren't allowed to speak. Um, even when they were working in the communal, um, out of separate confinement in the communal workroom, there was no speaking allowed, no talking allowed. Um, it was maybe outside on a work game they could speak, but I, not that. it was a horrible system. And having to do this, this monotonous, grinding, soul-destroying work, uh, but uh, yes, the other, everyone else who was convicted of over seven years 
was transported uh, to, the, to the colonies, which meant Western Australia at that time. <clears throat> Yeah, and even um, I think even the person that burnt the rick cart with um, Samuel, he ended up in WA as yes. well too. Yes, yeah. uh, yeah, his name was Tom Jones, Thomas Jones, and he was an older person. Uh, Samuel Speed's age at the time of the of the trial was given as eighteen. The prison records uh, six months after the trial say eighteen, and his convict record said he was twenty when he arrived in Western Australia. And I think that's about right. And I don't think the 14-year-old was likely to be of Sam Speed, the one born in 1849. Thomas Jones, he uh, came out separately to Speed. He was transported six months earlier and he was sent up to um, uh, the district around northern, north of Perth. Uh, Samuel Speed was sent down south when he got his ticket of leave around the Bustleton area. And during the research, I have to say, uh, we spent time in Perth, we spent time in Bustleton, and uh, it just shows you what landscapes can do uh, for a novelist when you're writing about something, to see the places. We were at a little tiny dot on the map south of Bustleton called Quindalup. And it was here at Quindalup that Sam Speed, when he had his ticket, was working in a timber mill at Quindalup. Sending jarrah planks uh, out of exporting jarrah and wood and timber from the port, and he was working at the mill. And I just walked, we just drove off the street into a place, had to have a look, see if we could find someone. And there was a whole beautifully restored little village of convict buildings since Speed's time. There was a house that the harbour master lived in, and the police play, uh, house uh, or the police office, and there was a, a jail. And there was a storage barn, and there'd been um, a place for, for, for cargo to be unloaded. It was all there, beautifully restored. And um, just to see these places that Sam would have known uh, was just wonderful. And you can draw all kinds of metaphors out of the landscape when you see it, and smells, and, and descriptions, and colours, and all of these things come alive. They've been alive. It's wonderful. And, also, and met a, we also met a descendant of the man who owned the mill. So it was, we kept in touch. It was great. So you really have lived and breathed Sam's story. You um, have to do it. You have yeah, to do it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, is there is there any more questions before we finish up? Very aware that it's it's almost um, time for us to finish. So um, I would like to say, if there's no more questions, a very big thank you. I've enjoyed this discussion immensely. Um, mm -hmm. I've enjoyed the book and I will donate my copy to the library for those people wishing to borrow it from the library. If you wish to purchase a copy for yourself, obviously, or for someone that you care about, just remember our independent booksellers on the, the Central Coast or wherever you are located. Um, it's nice to be able to support mm -hmm. them where we can. Um, I found it absolutely amazing and I found you a very engaging speaker and I'd just like to say thank you. Oh, thank you very much for having me. And I hope everyone else who reads it enjoys the book. Yeah, we've got some people who are very much looking forward to reading it in, in our comments. And for everybody who's joined us today, thank you very much for joining us. It's, um, it's amazing to see so many of you here. I think this is our first author talk for 2021, so it, it's fabulous. And if you're interested, there, there are a few more author talks coming up next week. We've got Anna George talking about tipping, and we have Deborah Rodriguez um, discussing the Moroccan daughter the week after, so feel free to join in. But for now, we'll We'll say goodbye and thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye and thanks for having me.